have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live up the true meaning of its creed. So even though we face the difficulties of the day and tomorrow, I still have a dream. For a number of years, the Negro passengers on the city bus lines of Montgomery have been humiliated, intimidated, and faced threats on this bus line. Just the other day, uh, one of the fine citizens of our community, Mrs. Rosa Parks, was arrested because she refused to give up her seat for a white passenger. Mrs. Rosa Parks was arrested and taken down to jail, taken from the bus, just because she refused to give up her seat. At present, we are in the midst of a protest, the Negro citizens of Montgomery, representing some 44% uh, of the population. 90% at least of the regular Negro bus passengers are staying off the buses, and we plan to continue until something is done. A middle-aged, black seamstress, Rosa Parks, sparked an end to segregation in public transportation with a brave but illegal act of protest. In Tuskegee, Alabama, she was born Rosa Louise McCauley in 1913, when the wounds of slavery were still painful to Southern blacks. For decades after the emancipation of slaves, Harsh conditions continued to oppress Southern blacks as they struggled to survive. Many of them were poor sharecroppers, uneducated, with few rights and little opportunity to rise above their circumstances. They feared the Ku Klux Klan, racist white thugs who roamed the streets at night clad in hooded white robes carrying flame torches to intimidate blacks with violence and the threat of lynching. The Ku Klux Klan uh, was not uh, an institution uh, that merely spoke or merely advocated uh, racial supremacy of the white race. It literally was a, uh, a terrorist, what we would today call a terrorist organization. Rosa's grandparents had been born slaves, but after emancipation, their parents managed to purchase a farm. As a small child, Rosa helped farm those 260 acres. Her mother taught Rosa to read before she began attending the local all-black elementary school. In her autobiography, she recounted that while she and her brother had to walk with other blacks to their one-room schoolhouse that often lacked desks, most of the white kids took buses to their brand new school. Rosa recalled when her grandmother severely reprimanded her for standing her ground with a brick when a white boy threatened to hit her in the street. After Northern troops withdrew from the South, the states enacted Jim Crow laws to keep blacks in their place. These laws made sure that blacks and whites did not have to come into close public contact. Facilities such as public bathrooms, water fountains, seating areas on buses, restaurants, hotels, hospitals, and schools. Every public necessity and service in the South was segregated and seemingly designed to make blacks feel inferior. It was common to see signs that read for color or white use only. These laws were considered fair and constitutional for many years. However, the reality of segregation was far from fair. It was profoundly destructive emotionally and psychologically. There are many ways that uh, the segregation uh, was implemented. It was implemented in housing such that there were covenants and real estate covenants that said that blacks uh, simply couldn't live in certain neighborhoods. It was implemented in education. 
meaning that blacks and whites could not uh, attend the same uh, public schools. There were issues that, as it related to uh, employment, such as many employers were literally prohibited uh, from hiring blacks. After completing the sixth grade at the age of 11, Rosa was sent to Montgomery, Alabama to attend the Industrial School for Girls, co-founded by the fearless Boston native, Mrs. Alice L. White. The school was run entirely by enlightened white women educated in the North. At this school, Rosa first experienced a culture of whites treating blacks with dignity and respect. Women had recently won the right to vote. Before that milestone, girls weren't expected the need of much education. But in the Roaring Twenties, Rosa's teachers encouraged her to develop a sense of her individual worth and seek opportunities no matter what stood in her way. Mrs. White was a brave role model. She knew firsthand the nature of the challenges Rosa would face since Mrs. White was ostracized by local whites for her work. Twice arsonists burned the school down. The white teachers were so condemned that some found it easier to attend black churches on Sunday. Rosa took a job at a shirt factory in Montgomery and in 1932, at the age of 19, met and married Raymond Parks, a barber and an active member of the Montgomery chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. The NAACP came into being because many of the issues that were facing African Americans uh, were not just a matter of being denied equal transportation, uh, not just being able to sit at lunch counters. Uh, African Americans were literally being threatened uh, in terms of their lives. Uh, there were race riots uh, in many of the cities in the South that were literally creating a situation where it was unsafe uh, to be African American in certain communities. In February 1909, the NAACP was founded by a small group of educated whites and blacks committed to protecting the human and legal rights of African Americans. The organizers understood that the U.S. Constitution and its overarching democratic laws held the key to freedom for all Americans, blacks included. The 15th Amendment of the Constitution gave black men the right to vote in 1870. Later, in 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified to give all women the right to vote but it was especially hard for blacks in the South to enjoy this right. The majority of whites did not want blacks to have any power. Registration officials invented so-called literary tests and charged poll taxes that made it impossible for poor, uneducated black citizens to vote. It even took Rosa, who was not poor and who was well-educated, three attempts before she succeeded in getting her registration certificate. In 1943, Rosa became an active member of the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP. The NAACP brought many lawsuits in attempts to use the federal courts to fight Jim Crow laws. For years, it met with little success. They want to throw white children and colored children into the melting pot of integration, through out of which will come a conglomerated, blatter, mongrel class of people. All races will be destroyed in such a movement. But in 1954, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, led by future Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall succeeded in arguing and winning a landmark case in the U.S. Supreme Court. Brown versus Board of Education brought the hammer down on segregation. 
For the first time, the Supreme Court ruled that segregation in public schools was unconstitutional nationwide. At last, people fighting racist treatment in the South were giving some hope and the encouragement necessary to persevere. In 1950, Negro parents, backed by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, brought suit against the Anderson County school system, which administers Clinton High School, asking that their children be admitted. The federal judge in this section of Tennessee in 1951, and now, is Robert L. Taylor of Knoxville. The Anderson County school case was before my court about five years ago. At that time, I held that the colored children were not entitled to enter the Clinton High School because they were being furnished equal but separate facilities. At that time, the equal but separate facility doctrine was the law. The Negroes appealed Judge Taylor's decision and when the Supreme Court decision of May 1954 ruled against segregation, Judge Taylor's ruling was reversed. On January 4, 1956, he ordered Anderson County to comply. It is the opinion of this court that desegregation as to high school students in that county should be effected by a definite date and that a reasonable date should be fixed as one not later than the beginning of the fall term of the present year of 1956. Accordingly, on August 20, 1956, approximately 700 students registered for the fall opening without incident. Twelve of them were Negroes. Judge Taylor told them all to obey the law and there seemed to be no questions. Then, another voice was heard in Clinton. John Casper, an outsider, a white supremacist, told them that the law need not be obeyed. Our failure to date has been failing to attack. Failing to attack. Failing to attack at every level and continuously. But we in the White Citizens Council say now, yesterday, today, and forever, as long as there is one living white man in the United States, the Supreme Court is not the law of the land. That decision is not the law of the land now, or it never will be. Never. One of the daily injustices black people endured was on public transportation. Though most of the people who rode buses were black, southern cities only hired white bus drivers who had the authority to say who sat where on the bus. Since many whites didn't want to sit with black people, it became customary for blacks to board buses from the rear and sit in the back. Whites sat in the front, although all paid the same fare. If the bus filled up, it was expected that black passengers would give up their seats for white passengers and stand in the back. Rosa was returning home on a city bus after a long day working as a seamstress at a local department store. Blake was the driver. Although Parks was sitting in the black section, she was in the first row. One white man needed a seat, so Blake approached the four blacks sitting there and told them to get up. Three did. Parks didn't. These front seats were occupied, and with one man, a white man standing, at this point, the driver asked us to stand up and let him have those seats. And when uh, neither, none of us moved at his first uh, words, he said, y'all make it light on yourselves and let me have those seats. And when the policeman approached me, one of them spoke and asked me if the driver had, to, had, uh, had asked me to stand. I said, yes. He said, why don't you stand up? I said, I don't think I should have to stand up. And I asked him, I said, why do you push us around? He said, I do not know, but the law is a law. Yet again, 
she found herself confronting the mean and ugly face of segregation. On that day, December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks was arrested. After she was arrested, the black leaders at the time, spearheaded by Martin Luther King, said, why don't we just stop writing these buses altogether? One of the interesting things is that three quarters of the riders of the buses in Montgomery, Alabama were black. Word spread through the city. That night, the Women's Political Council printed and distributed an auspicious flyer throughout the Montgomery's black community. It began, another woman has been arrested and thrown in jail because she refused to get up out of her seat on a bus for a white person to sit down. This has to be stopped. Negroes have rights to. For if Negroes did not ride the buses, they could not operate. This woman's case will come up on Monday. We are, therefore, asking every Negro to stay off the buses Monday in protest of the arrest and trial. Don't ride the buses to work, to town, to school, or anywhere on Monday. Many tired people were about to be raised up and energized by Rosa Parks' simple refusal to give her seat. After posting bail the day of her arrest, on December 5, 1955, Rosa Parks showed in court again for trial. That day, city buses drove their routes practically empty. People carpooled or just walked to work. Parks was found guilty of breaking the law and fined. That evening, black commuters gathered in the basement of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church pastored by a relatively unknown preacher, the 26-year-old Reverend Martin Luther King. The Montgomery bus boycott of 1955 had begun. When Rosa refused to relinquish her seat, she didn't know her cause would start a boycott or become a test case for fighting segregation on public transportation. The fairness of segregation on buses needed to be argued in a federal court. Ultimately, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, led by Thurgood Marshall, took the case before the U.S. Supreme Court. In 1956, Rosa's conviction was overturned. The highest court in the land struck down state's laws that allowed segregation on public transportation. The boycott lasted 382 days. The decision rendered by the Supreme Court yesterday was a victory. Yeah. But it wasn't a victory for colored folks. Don't, don't make that victory that small. It wasn't a victory for 50,000 Negroes in Montgomery. It wasn't a, merely a victory for 16 million Negroes of America. That was a victory for justice yeah. and goodwill. Rosa and many more would never ride a segregated bus again. The call of the civil rights movement was soon felt throughout the country. It invited all freedom-loving people to join together against oppressive laws and governments, racial discrimination and hatred. Needing a fresh start, in 1957, the Parks moved to Detroit. Rosa got a job on the staff of the United States Congressman John Conyers, Jr. In 1964, the work and sacrifices made by thousands of activists, white and black, paid off. Congress passed the Civil Rights Act legislation that outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. The next year, the Voting Rights Act passed. In recognition of her service, she won many awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom presented to her by President Clinton in 1996. In 1999, she was awarded 
the Congressional Gold Medal. October 24, 2005, Rosa Parks died at the age of 92. She was the first and only woman to have her casket placed in the rotunda of the United States Capitol, an honor usually reserved for U.S. presidents. For two days, the public was invited to pay respects to a woman whose courage and belief in herself inspired a nation to change. Today, all citizens enjoy the freedom to register and to vote without fear. There are no more racist signs on public facilities. The United States elected its first African-American president in 2008. Rosa Parks led the way.